right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction. It's, uh, it's really great to be here with all of you guys today. Um, lots of familiar faces, some people I don't know quite yet, um, but it's really fun to be here. Um, as, the, as you heard in the bio, I'm a, an alum of this school, a very proud alum, um, and so it's always nice to, to talk to other UVU students, alums, and, and others that, um, that are part of this really fine institution. I did want to first thank Belinda and her team. They've got a great program here. Um, a great center. I remember when they first established the Center for the Advancement of Leadership here, and it was just this small thing that they just, you know, they just started. Uh, and it, and now look, I mean, this is amazing. This is just one part of this program that you guys have here. So this is great, and uh, and you should be really proud to be affiliated with it. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about a few things today. I want to talk about, you know, my experience at UVU, my sort of leadership story here. Uh, talk a little bit about my career and some of the things that I was able to do before I came back to UVU, um, and, uh, and, and then talk a little bit about uh, our program here that we have in national security. And I also wanted to give you some takeaways. So I thought at the beginning that, um, or when I was putting this together, I thought I'd end with these kind of takeaways. But I think I'm going to start with them, because I want you to see throughout the conversation, throughout the, the discussion that we have today, the way that these principles or that these I don't know, character traits um, can be applied throughout a career, uh, using my career as both good and, and bad examples of, of application. So let me start with that. Um, if, if, if I look throughout my career and kind of see, you know, what, um, what are the things that I saw that helped me or what are some of the things that I saw some of my colleagues do that helped them, um, there's about five or six, we'll see how, how this works, um, that I think are, are kind of key to having some success and, and finding um, you know, some meaningful purpose in, in the things that you do. So the first one is, I think the hardest one for students that I talk to, um, it certainly was hard for me too, but the first one is be daring, is to just be daring, to take a risk. Uh, eventually you have to get out of your comfort zone, you have to do something that scares you, um, that makes you feel like you might be making a mistake. Um, there is that leap of faith at a certain point. And so for a lot of people, that's either moving out of Utah or it's moving out of their uh, parents' home or it's um, switching to a new program or something like that. Um, taking a job that you're not sure about but that looks like it could be something that could propel you into uh, where you want to go in the future. So you have to be daring. Um, along with that, you have to be flexible. So it's it's a temptation to think that things are just going to work out, um, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes you go down a path, and you realize that, no, nope, this is not what I want to do. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of students in my classes that are you know, later in life, and they come back, and they, they've figured out they want to try something different. And I think that's great, uh, because we have to be flexible. Uh, we have to not put our eggs in one basket um, and, and you know, be open to the opportunities that may arise and present themselves to you. I think college is a great experience for that, too, that um, if you come in and you're not too rigid about what you want to do, that you, you might find things that take you by surprise and, and uh, lead you in a different direction. Um, the other one is, uh, or another one is be prepared. Um, so when that opportunity does arise, you're ready. You're ready to make the most of it. You're ready to really seize that opportunity. Um, and there's a few instances that I'll talk about later uh, that, you know, that part was key. A lot of my students will come to me and they'll say, oh, I really want to do this internship or I really, this job looks amazing. And it is. And, and if they get it, that's a great achievement. But that's just the first step of that achievement. That's actually the least difficult part of the achievement is getting the, the job or the internship or into the program. The harder part is, is really succeeding in it and then using that as a stepping stone to something else. Um, so preparation uh, is, is absolutely key. Um, let's see. Be determined. Or another way of saying is be persistent. Um, don't accept no for an answer, at least not the first time. This doesn't apply to everything in life. If you guys are in personal relationships, that may not apply. Um, <laughs> sometimes you just need to walk away, and that's okay. But, but with career goals and, and other things that you're trying to accomplish in life, if someone tells you no, that's just the first step. Um, you, you still have other opportunities. Um, and again, I'll, I'll highlight some examples of that. This is another one. As a UVU alum, 
This institution has blown up. When I went to school here a while back, when it had a different name, you remember, um, uh, this was a different place. This is, this is a really fine institution. But that said, if you're out in the world competing with your Ivy League institution graduates or you know, people with a lot of connections or things like that, the great equalizer in my experience has been hard work. If you're willing to outwork everyone around you, um, then you, there's really no end to the things that you can accomplish. So be the hardest worker in whatever organization or entity you're part of. Okay, those are, so those are my, um, my key traits, and, and we'll talk more about them as we, as we go through this. Um, so I wanted to talk, I, I got my start here at UVU, um, and when I came to UVU, it really was with the intention of staying here for a semester or two, getting some uh, transfer credits, and then, and then leaving. Um, and, and I got here and just fell in love with the place. I, it, was, it felt like an environment where you could really achieve things, that, that there was just so much promise, that there was so much opportunity. Um, so I, I stayed at UVU, uh, and it was a, a terrific experience. I, when I first got here, I was a freshman. Um, there was an opportunity on student government to be the business senator, and so I did that. I wasn't in the business school, but it was a great experience. Um, representing business students. Uh, and the, the year after that, I, um, well, I served an LDS mission uh, in the Philippines, and that was a life-changing experience um, and really kind of made me more interested in international affairs, which would um, be a major factor for me later on. Uh, I came back, and um, another, you know, someone else resigned from something, and I had the opportunity to be, again, on student government vice president of clubs. That was a great experience. And I decided that I would run for student body president. So I, I got this campaign together. This is also the experience that made me never want to run for public office, which is, I guess you get out of your system early. I just, it was, uh, um, no matter what you run for, it's always difficult. And for those of you that have done this in your life, it, it's just a, it's a difficult experience. But I ran for student body president. I believed in what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a very, um, active platform of both kind of political engagement um, on behalf of the students, but um, and also just uh, other kinds of student opportunities that, that we were interested in doing. So we won. Um, I served as student body president, uh, was able to represent the students on a statewide level too with the Utah Student Association, and it was great. And then my senior year, I served as the ombudsman here on campus. I, I, I only highlight these things to tell you that there's just so many things on campus to get involved with. Um, I chose the student government route. There's so many other things. Uh, there are clubs. There are journals. There are um, other kinds of organizations. There's you know, the Center for the Advancement of Leadership. There's so many things that you could get involved in. But, but do something. Really you know, try something, especially if, it, if you think it is difficult. Uh, because that's not only it will make you learn a different thing, but it also, I think, makes you more uh, of that kind of person that will try to do harder and more difficult things. Um, the other thing that I, I think is especially appropriate today uh, is when I was in college, that's when the 9-11 attacks happened. Um, I showed up to school that morning, got in here. This is when they still had TVs in the hallway, those big boxy TVs. And everyone was standing around them, and everyone was wondering what was going on. And at first, everyone thought it was an accident. And then pretty quickly, we, we learned that it was not an accident. But that was a, a very, very meaningful, um, significant experience in my life and in the lives of a lot of other people ar around my age and my generation. And uh, that is the moment that I knew I kind of felt like that's what I want to do. I, wanna, I want to do counterterrorism. I want to do national security. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I started uh, school as a business major, came back and, and thought I'd do political science and um, you know, do some kind of state government thing. And then that, that coupled with my time in the Philippines really, really showed me that this is the area that really interests me and, and you know, I felt compelled to serve. Um, and so that's, that's where I pursued my career after that. So I went to, um, I applied to law schools. Um, I uh, eventually, I got into the school that I wanted to, which was American University in Washington, D.C. They have a great international program, international law program, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, I felt like I had to make 
the most use of my time there too. So I worked during the day. I worked in Senator Hatch's office doing his foreign policy, national security work as a legislative correspondent, and uh, and and then went to school at night. After a year, I decided that that wasn't going to work out because there's just too many other things that I wanted to do. But it was a great experience, and I always encourage my students too to look at the Hill for um, for really interesting work because if you work on the Hill, you there's such a wide range of things. You really touch on everything, um, especially, well, on both sides, on the Senate and the House side. There's just so many things that, um, that you're engaged with. And it was a great experience. Um, it also showed me, I, I remember I was working in Senator Hatch's office, and my grandma, she would tell me, she's like, you know, I love Senator Hatch because he always answers my mail. And I didn't have the heart to tell her that, no, Grandma, I'm answering your mail. And he's signing it. I appreciate all the letters, but you could stop at some point. Just give me more work. Um, so Senator Hatch, that was a great experience, worked in his office, then decided to go back to or, or just uh, pursue law, uh, law school full time. Um, but that didn't go for very long. Eventually, I had an opportunity in my second year to uh, work at the Public International Law and Policy Group. Never had heard of them before, but they looked really interesting. And again, this is one of those things where I didn't w think about going this route, but it was an opportunity that was there. Um, and so I took it. And then I was ready. I had written a lot. I had, you know, I was a hard worker. I was going, I was determined to make the most of this. And I remember in, towards the second year of law school, my boss came to me. He was the president of the, um, of the firm that we were working at. And he said, hey, we work for non-state clients. So he said, hey, Kosovo is thinking about declaring independence from Serbia um, formally. And we are, you know, we're working for them. We want a draft declaration of independence and a draft constitution. Can you do that for me? My second year law student. So I said, of course, yeah, I would love to do that. Not knowing that, you know, I was like, oh, I should go get a quill pen, and like a three-corner hat, and just act like a, a founder, and this would be great. So I just, I went up to the library and started studying other constitutions. The big constitutions at the time were South African and the Polish constitution, and so I was looking at those models. And eventually came up with a great draft, sent it to them. They sent it to the Kosovars. They were happy with it. And they've changed a whole bunch of stuff, um, which was fine. But if I, once they declared independence and issued a statement, and once they writ, wrote their constitution and passed it, I looked in, I could still see my fingerprints on that document, which I thought was just amazing uh, that a second year law student could do, you know, could be involved in something like that. It didn't seem like something that um, was real. So it's right place, right time. I mean, there were a lot more qualified people than me to, uh, to do that work, but I was just there. Um, and I had made a good impression on my boss, and, and he gave me that, um, that honor. So I worked at PILPG for a couple years, uh, managed a team in my second year. We had a lot of clients um, that we worked with, non-state clients mostly in Africa, in Europe, um, a couple in Asia, and it was a really amazing experience. But my goal was eventually, like I said, with the 9-11 experience, was to come back into government and work on um, national security. So. In my third year, I took an internship. I, left, I, I sort of left PILPG and I took an internship uh, with the State Department. And State Department seemed like the perfect fit for me. Um, they were the chief foreign policy instrument for the US government. Uh, I had this kind of pathway in there. I worked there for a whole year. Usually internships last three months or so, but I was able to kind of extend that into a year-long thing. They were happy with my work. Uh, and when I graduated, they gave me an offer. Um, and uh, and then I, I had applied for something else, the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, and they gave me an offer. So this is where I'm presented with, do I take the path I know that I'm comfortable with? I really, you know, I've always wanted to work at State Department. Or there's this new thing from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And I went to my mentors and said, what do you think? What should I do? I've got these great offers. What should I take? And most of them said, Take the DOD one. Um, I think it'd be a good fit for you and you know, be within your interests area and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I did. I took that offer, uh, the one that I knew nothing about. My family, I had very little military history, um, didn't have really that much exposure to the Department of Defense either, uh, but it seemed like a good fit and my mentors were all, all telling me this. This is another valuable lesson too, is to keep those mentors, professors, people that you work for, that have been in that field, 
they can be extremely helpful as you especially take those first few steps. In fact, I've always been surprised too throughout my career that I'll, I'll reach back at various stages, Senator Hatch's office or State Department or even UVU, um, I'll reach back at contacts and, and you know, mentors that I hadn't talked to in years, but that became very valuable um, at a certain point in life. Just unpredictable things, but always a good idea to keep those contacts fresh and, and um, you know, have those good relationships that you can rely on. So I went to the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Totally new thing, uh, very excited about it. But again, I was given this opportunity at the beginning. Where do you wanna, where do you wanna work within OSD? Um, I don't know, what do you recommend? And they said, well, you can go do these things, these things that looked more interesting to me, or you can go to the budget planning office and learn about how it all works. Anybody that knows me at all knows numbers, nope. Uh, budgeting, not really. Uh, that's not really my thing at all. And, um, but I, I thought that, and based on what people were telling me, this would be the harder one, but it would be the, the better one for me down the road to really understand DOD is a multi-billion dollar enterprise. I mean, it's this massive machine um, that supplies our, our whole defense apparatus. Uh, so understanding that system was gonna be critical going down the road. So I did that, I took a chance, did budgeting, hated it, uh, but it was a good experience and it really did educate me and help me to understand things you know, as, a, as a whole. Um, then I went to the strategy office, which was very interesting. Strategy um, is the office where, in part, you do long-term thinking. So what is, what is Russia going to look like in 20 years, and how do we respond to that? What is China going to be? How are they going to be positioned against the United States? We do war planning, war games, where we would um, simulate a scenario where Russia uh, takes the Antarctic region and, and you know, claims it as its own, and how do we respond to that? And we do all these interesting things. Um, and, uh, and that was a really, really fun job. It was a really interesting experience. I was in that office for a bit, and um, I gotta say, we got most of Russia wrong, so sorry. Uh, we, tried, we, we tried to think what Russia would be like, and we got it wrong within four or five years. This is how it goes. Uh, we had other options, but they didn't pan out. Um, Lastly, so the last office I went in kind of morphed a little bit while I was there. I did, um, I worked in detainee policy at the beginning. So people are like, oh, what are detainees? So I, I worked Guantanamo Bay issues um, and Bagram issues and the end of Iraq. So all these detainees, these uh, people that we had captured on the battlefield and then detained, we needed policy, we needed oversight, we needed all this kind of stuff for that. And so that was, um, that's what I worked on. So I spent a lot, I, I did a lot of trips to Guantanamo, I did a lot of tip, trips to Afghanistan, um, and, uh, you know, and that had its, uh, that, that had some interesting parts to it as well. Um, I should tell you one story, just because it's, it's probably my favorite Gitmo story, my favorite Guantanamo story. And this is a good lesson, too, in terms of knowing what's going to happen before you start down the road a little bit. So especially when you're working in, the, in you know, this kind of environment. We, at, at Gitmo, some of the detainees were hunger striking. Um, and we didn't know why. Uh, well, we knew why, but we, we knew that it was a command thing, mostly. The commanders in the, the detainees, the higher ranking detainees, were telling the lower ranking detainees to hunger strike. And so we um, were trying to figure out, well, what do we do? Do we let them hunger strike? If so, how long? Like, do we allow them to kill themselves? Um, and we resolve pretty quickly that, no, we're not going to let, we'll let them hunger strike because it's a conscience thing and, and you know, we, we have to allow that. But we're not going to let them go below a certain BMI level. Then we'll intervene. And when we intervened, we would enterally feed them. So a lot of people at hospitals are familiar with this. You put the to tube up their nose and then you do that, um, what's that lady, uh, drink that old lady's, um, ensure. Uh, <coughs> ensure. So we give them in these insurance. There was like five different uh, um, uh, tastes uh, that they could choose from. So they would, usually the detainees would use their own insurer and they would, they would do this. And, um, but there were a couple that would not do it. So we had to strap them on the table and we had to put the tube up and, and, and feed them until they had had enough and then they weren't uh, in danger of losing their life. So 
Um, the human rights groups were really upset about this. They thought it was a violation. So we said, all right, why don't we take them down and show them the process? Because it's maybe just a misunderstanding. They think we're doing something that we're not. Okay, let's do that. So my boss at the time, he's a former colonel in the Marine Corps. He's like, all right, I'm going to do it. Like, you guys feed me. Okay, I guess, okay, we could do that. So we go down there where, you know, the, the uh, Navy corpsman, she um, puts my boss on the table. She starts to get the, you know, the tube out. She starts to put it in his nose. It's not going anywhere. She's just like jamming it in there. It's not going anywhere. And then, um, you know, after a while, we start looking at each other like, what is going on? This is not working out. And then the tear heard around the world comes down his face. Marine Corps colonel on the table, and there's a tear down his face. We're like, this is the ultimate backfire. We're trying to show them that this is a humane practice, that it's great, it's above board, and our Marine Corps colonel is crying on the table. So she leans over and says, sir, have you broken your nose? Yes, I have. Okay, other nostril, right through, no problem, but not without completely ruining the whole objective of the trip. So one, know if you've broken your nose, um, and two, know that before you try to be enterly fed. These are, see, these are, the less, these are the life lessons that are really important to learn. Um, after working in detainee policy for a while, my portfolio shifted and I did more of the international negotiations work. So I would travel to foreign countries, mostly Europe, and, um, and represent the United States. So one of the, one of the cool things with that was um, there's just, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to kind of state, but it's, there's just something humbling about sitting behind the United States placard and representing your country. I mean, it sounds kind of corny, but it's, um, you're sitting at the table, there's all these countries from around the world, everyone's got their headset in so you can understand what they're saying. Um, but you are the representative of the American people. It's just, it's one of those really humbling things. And yeah, there's a group that you met with before that said every single thing you could say while you're out there. Um, but it, it's, uh, it was really an amazing experience. So representing the United States was, was really an honor for me and, and a humbling thing. Um, I did a lot of international negotiations, um, mostly on war type issues, so uh, the rules governing war and um, international criminal work and, and things like that. Um, at one point we went to Saudi Arabia, this is another kind of funny story, there, we went to Saudi Arabia um, to negotiate sort of the repatriation of certain individuals to their country. And we were in a tent. They were giving us this food. By the way, amazing food. It was um, amazing, uh, really nice, nice of them to do this. And then at some point in the dinner, someone leans over our shoulders and they say, we have your gift for you. Now, for those of you that have worked for the federal government, you know you can't accept anything above $20. $20 is the limit of, of a gift that you can accept. Because that way, you're not open to corruption or bribery or anything like that. So the guy says, we have your gift for you. OK, uh, maybe a picture or a plaque or something like that. He takes us outside, and there's a camel. So the guy was gifting us a camel. And so we're like, OK, um, this is too big of a gift, uh, and that we have no way of getting it home. We've already arranged for it to travel, to ship it out to you. OK. Um, how much did this camel cost? <laughs> is it $20 or less? Uh, oh, it's a million dollars. OK, well, we're in big trouble. Um, so it was a difficult situation to try to tell our host, who had been very gracious to us, that we could not accept the camel. Um, but my boss, very, he, he was very clever about it. He said, why don't we have the camel stay here? And every time I come back, I'll come visit the camel. OK, we can do that. Good, we're good. All right, OK, let's go. Um, I, I kind of wish we would have been able to take the camel. That would have been fun. Um, so, so that was my time at the Pentagon. At a, at a certain point, um, working at the Pentagon, I got to say, it was, it was really a dream job. When I graduated from law school, a lot of my friends uh, were working at law firms, and some of them were working at other agencies. And I felt like I just had the, the best job. It was just so much fun. I loved going to work every day. Um, I got to travel all over the place. Uh, I got to do things that I never thought that I would do. Um, it was just a great experience. And, and, and all this while, you know, serving my country, doing what I wanted to do, um, which was uh, 
contribute to the national security counterterrorism strategy and policy of the United States. It was exactly what I wanted to do. And, and, and when I looked back on it, I thought, how? Like, how did this work out this way? Because really, you know, and I'm not saying this just kind of out of, like, uh, you know, um, self-deprecation or anything. But there are a lot of people that were just as smart, just as, you know, um, credentialed or anything. And it was just taking the right opportunities at the right time and just being open to it. Um, and then not allowing, you know, a setback to be, um, to be so frustrating that I wasn't willing to try again. Because believe me, I mean, if you try things, you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have people that say no. You're going to have uh, rejection. You know, I got rejected from a lot of schools and I got rejected from certain jobs and, you know, there are a lot of things like that that happen. But just that, that resolution that I'm not going to, you know, accept, um, accept no for an answer, uh, I think is, is, is really key. After, uh, so while I'm at the Pentagon, at the, toward the end there, um, we're trying to think of, my wife and I are trying to think, well, what's next? What do we do now? Because um, I'd risen to a level where I kind of had to make choices. Either leave and do the political route, so you have to choose a side, um, or, or do something different. And I had been adjunct teaching at American University and really liked it. Um, I really liked being around students and helping them to find uh, their own path, you know, to find their own um, thing that they really loved and wanted to do and, and drive them towards that. And I love the classroom experience. I love talking about these issues. Sometimes when you're gov in government, it's so hard because you're just right here. It's just the crisis of the moment that you're working on. And you really don't have the time to step back and see the big picture. Um, so academia allowed that. It allowed you to kind of step back with students who were just you know, learning the, the beginning parts of this and, and really have that discussion. I, th I, I really loved it. So I thought, well, um, you know, maybe we, maybe we move to Utah and work in a national security program there. So I looked, and there's no national security program in Utah, nothing. And then even in the surrounding states, nothing, nothing in Colorado and Idaho, Nevada. Um, you really had to go to San Bernardino, um, no offense but to anybody that's from there, but um, San Bernardino as a, the national security program, or Nebraska. Those are the two closest ones to Utah. So I thought, well, let's just propose one. Uh, propose a national security program, and I went to UVU. I think it would be a great fit for this, so let's propose it there first and see what happens. Uh, so we did, and two years later, it all worked out. Um, it took a long time. This is how things go. I thought government bureaucracy was slow. Nope. Academic bureaucracy, even slower. Uh, some of you know this. Uh, but they took a chance, and that's what I love about this school, is that UBU is that place where you take chances on big ideas. Um, President Holland's going to speak tomorrow on, on things like, uh, like that, that subject. There's so many great examples of it. This is a school where you can come in and, and take a chance on something that, that could be huge. And now we're the only national security program in the state. We're the only national security center in the state. We have this kind of corner on this market, um, all sorts of recognition for what we're doing here, and it's great. Um, and it's, and it, it's due to our students. Our students are the ones that build that reputation for us. The thing I also love about UVU, and I worked at a law school in between. I went to Chicago, taught law. And Chicago Kent, the, the school I was working for, had the same kind of reputation as UVU. That, you know, in terms of rankings, they weren't ranked near the top. It, it wasn't, you know, they were competing against bigger dogs in the state. You know, it, in Chicago is Northwestern and the U University of Chicago. Here there are obvious schools that, you know, we think of. Um, but the Chicago Kent students were known as like being very scrappy, hard workers. They'll, they're willing to do anything. Um, to, to move you know, their career forward. And that's what I've heard already in my couple years back here about UVU students. We've sent students to, uh, to Capitol Hill to intern. We have a student that went to uh, the US Embassy in Croatia. We had a student that went to the Pentagon um, and uh, worked um, with the joint staff. We, we have students that have done amazing things. And the feedback that I've gotten, and people have contacted me after their internships and said, they're, they're well prepared. They're hardworking. They're prepared. We were surprised. We were really surprised with how good they were. That's awesome. For me, that's, that's the ultimate compliment is that our students 
are impressing people that are in the field. Um, and that's, that's exactly why I wanted to uh, do this program here. So that brings us uh, to where we are right now. Um, when, when, uh, when I started here, when I started at UVU, I didn't have any idea of where I would end up. I had no clue that um, I would end up in Washington, D.C. and be able to do the things that I was able to do. Um, I had no idea that I'd come back. Honestly, when I left, I never thought I would come back here, only because I thought my career would always be in Washington. But man, I could not be happier uh, to be back here and, and to be with these great students. Um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity. It's been a, a really fun career. I hope um, that I've illustrated those points that I led with. Um, and I did want to end with one thing, too, before we do uh, question and answer. It's September 11th. To me, it's always it's a significant day. It's a it's a day that I you know I, I always have some pause and and you know think about where we were, where we've come, um, and where we are today. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about patriotism, because when I told you when when the 9/11 attacks happened, and a lot of people thought you know I want to I want to contribute, I want to help somehow. A lot of people joined the military, which I think is awesome. But the military service is not the only way to serve your country. Um, there's a lot of ways to serve your country. So if you're, if you're not one of those people that's, that's driven to um, you know, service in the military, there are so many things that you could, you could do uh, to serve your community. And they don't all have to be in national security. I mean, they, they are, there are so many things in your lives um, that you could do to serve your community, serve the people around you. I, you know, I hesitate saying this. Um, but patriotism has to be, has to mean more than just sort of waving the flag on the 4th of July or waving the flag on some holiday. I, I say I hesitate that because I have Stars and Stripes socks on, so it's kind of rings hollow. But, um, but patriotism has to be something that is service-based. That means that you, you know, it, it's more than just rote kind of, um, you know, uh, affirmations about the country. Patriotism has to be about wanting to serve your country. It has to be not about unity of opinion, but unity of purpose. Unity of purpose in, in serving this great country, serving our great people. Uh, it's, I think it's so important, it's especially important today that we see, you know, that we look for ways to serve. Um, serve our country, serve our community, serve our families, uh, and, and you know, build, build the country that way. So I think I'll end there and um, leave some time for questions and answer. And we can just do this open question and answer, and then I'm happy to stick around after if you have kind of one-on-one -on -one things that you want to talk about. This is always the awkward first question. Who's going to do it? Yes? Did I enjoy my time in Afghanistan? Um, well, I did enjoy being shot at. Uh, that was not fun. Um, it was very educational, and I have to say, there's always this, and for those that have been, how many of you guys have been to Afghanistan, have served in Afghanistan? Okay, one person. All right, so uh, it's this weird mix of this sense of adventure, and, um, you know, you're out there, and, and it's just, you know, there's kind of adrenaline rush versus this feeling of, what am I doing here? Um, because it's a dangerous place. And, and I, I have to tell you, like every time I was there, every time I was, you know, out with our troops on the front line, like, you know, moving from location to location, I had a greater sympathy for them because they're, they're in this impossible situation where it looks like everyone wants to kill you. Um, but they have to be so careful about, you know, engaging the community and things like that. I, I, it really impressed me, the professionalism of the military there. Um, so did I enjoy it? Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting place to, to visit, um, and uh, I was always glad to leave and come back to the United States. Yeah. Yeah, so I had one year in between uh, the end of my undergraduate education and law school. Um, and the reason was is that 
the schools that I had offers to the first year were just not the right fit. And so I, I applied to a bunch of law schools and didn't work out. Um, didn't work out the way that I wanted it to. And so I just kind of bunkered down and um, retook the LSAT and reapplied, and, and then it did work out the next year. Is that it, or one more? Or? One more. Um, a little bit, yeah. All uh, sort of informal, though. It's not a formal relationship, but yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to stay after and, and talk.